How shall we search the scriptures? Shall we drive our stakes of doctrine one after another and then try to make all scripture meet our established opinions? Or shall we take our ideas and views to the scriptures and measure our theories on every side by the scriptures of truth? Many who read and even teach the Bible do not comprehend the precious truth they are teaching or studying. The search for truth requires a willingness to lay aside preconceived ideas and obey new convictions. Nowhere is this more evident than in a study of the lunar Sabbath. Because the Sabbath is very precious to all who have been convicted to worship on the seventh day of the week, it can be emotionally devastating to be presented with evidence that Saturday is not the biblical Sabbath. Rather than rejecting the lunar Sabbath because it contradicts previous assumptions, all should commit to study the subject thoroughly. Careful study reveals the truth and allows the Holy Spirit time to settle a person into that truth so that he cannot be shaken. In Patriarchs and Prophets, Ellen White clearly states that the weak has been preserved by God and came down from creation. Clearly, this supports Saturday, the seventh day of the week, as the original Bible Sabbath. Depending upon the knowledge a person has and the assumptions being made, this quote in Patriarchs and Prophets can be interpreted one of two ways. The quote itself states, Like the Sabbath, the week originated at creation, and it has been preserved and brought down to us through Bible history. God himself measured off the first week as a sample for successive weeks to the close of time. Like every other, it consisted of seven literal days. Six days were employed in the work of creation. Upon the seventh, God rested, and he then blessed this day and set it apart as a day of rest for man. If a person assumes the seven-day week has cycled continuously and without interruption ever since creation, then this quote does indeed appear to support Saturday as the Sabbath of creation. However, the facts of history reveal this is not correct. Therefore, another interpretation of the quote must be sought. Scripture, history, and archaeology all agree that the Hebrew month was lunar. The SDA Bible Dictionary agrees with many other sources when it states, The Hebrew month was lunar, beginning with the evening on which the crescent moon appeared. The first day of the month was called the new moon. At first, visual observation was used to determine the appearance of the crescent. If the crescent was seen on the evening following the 29th day of the month, a new month had begun. If not, another day was added so that that particular month had 30 days. A month never had more than 30 days. Not just the Hebrews, but all ancient peoples used the moon for regulating their months. Scriptural and archaeological evidence reveals the weekly cycle restarted with each new moon. It was not until a few hundred years before the Savior came that a continuous weekly cycle came into use in the calendar of Babylon. Throughout history, there have been weeks of many different lengths. In Africa, weeks ranged in length anywhere from three to eight days long. In South America, the Maya had five-day weeks, Others had three- and four-day weeks. The ancient Etruscans and the Romans used an eight-day week. As recently as 1790, 
the French adopted a calendar with a 10-day week. Beginning August 26, 1929, the Soviet Union had first five-day and later six-day weeks until June 26, 1940, when a seven-day week was finally restored. Satan has sought throughout history to destroy the seven-day week. But just as Ellen White said, Yahuwah himself has preserved it. The quote in question is simply stating that Creation Week was a sample for the length of the week for all time. It showed that all the weeks that followed it were also to be seven days long. The quote says nothing about the weekly cycle. It refers only to the length of creation week being the pattern for all other weeks. The week as an individual unit of time has been preserved as a model that every week is to have six working days ending with the Sabbath rest on the seventh day. When the Julian calendar transitioned to the Gregorian calendar, there was no break in the weekly cycle. Thus, Saturday is and always has been the seventh day of the week. It is true when Pope Gregory XIII revised the Julian calendar, the weekly cycle was not disrupted. Thursday, October 4, 1582 was followed the next day by Friday, October 15. The weekly cycle was not disrupted at all. Because the Gregorian calendar was viewed with suspicion as a Catholic calendar, most of the world did not accept it until much later. England and her colonies did not make the change until 1752. Other European and Asian countries did not accept the Pope's calendar until the 20th century. However, this does not prove Saturday is and always has been the seventh day of the week. The belief the week was cycled continuously and without interruption ever since creation is an assumption based on ignorance of the facts of history. Julius Caesar, with the help of Sosigenes, an Alexandrian astronomer, reformed the lunisolar calendar of the Roman Republic to make a strictly solar calendar, the Julian calendar. This calendar had an eight-day week with days designated by the letters A through H. An eight-day week is clearly discernible on these stone fragments from an early Julian calendar. Later, with the adoption of Mithraism by the Romans, the eight-day week was set aside in favor of the pagan planetary week. This week was not modeled after the seven-day Israelite week. It was a planetary week beginning on Saturn's day and ending on Venus day or the modern Friday. It is not to be doubted that the diffusion of the Iranian Persian mysteries has had a considerable part in the general adoption by the pagans of the week with the Sunday as a holy day. The names that we employ unawares for the other six days came into use at the same time that Mithraism won its followers in the provinces in the West. And one is not rash in establishing a relation of coincidence between its triumph and that concomitant phenomenon. The preeminence assigned to the Dies Solis, Day of the Sun, also certainly contributed to the general recognition of Sunday as a holiday. This is connected with a more important fact, namely the adoption of the week by all the European nations. The facts of history reveal that the modern week, like the pagan Julian calendar that adopted it, comes directly from paganism. 
It is the continuously cycling pagan week that was not disrupted when the pagan Julian calendar transitioned to the papal Gregorian calendar. Lunar Sabbatarians worship on Sunday. The floating Sabbath occasionally falls on Sunday. Thus, anyone worshiping on a lunar Sabbath will receive the mark of the beast, because worship on Sunday is the mark of the beast. Lunar Sabbatarians never worship on Sunday. They only and ever worship on the Seventh-day Sabbath. The Gregorian calendar, with its continuous weekly cycle, is a different form of time measurement from the lunisolar calendar, with its weekly cycle anchored to the lunations of the moon. The Holy Sabbath always falls on the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th days of the lunar month. Therefore, dates from the continuous weekly cycle fall on differing dates on the fixed cycle of a lunar month. The days of the planetary Gregorian week move through the fixed dates of the lunar month. Thus, sometimes a Sunday, a Tuesday, or a Saturday will coincide with the true biblical Sabbath. Scripture contains a very fearful warning. This warning is the last message of mercy heaven brings to earth. Revelation 13 warns of a tremendous confrontation in the near future. The conflict will center on worship and none who worship independently of the majority will be allowed to buy or sell. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both great and small, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred threescore and six. This conflict is a battle over worship, specifically when to worship, since the day on which a person worships reveals the deity he worships. The Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment is the seal of the living God. It points to God as the Creator and is the sign of His rightful authority over the beings He has made. What then is the mark of the beast if it is not the spurious Sabbath which the world has accepted in the place of the true? In accordance with Bible prophecy, truths long lost and hidden under error and superstition are now being restored. The final conflict is much larger than simply a battle between two differing days on the Gregorian calendar. The cosmic controversy is over the worship of Satan on any day but the true Sabbath versus the worship of the Creator on his one and only Seventh-day Sabbath. Satan's elaborate system of counterfeit worship is referred to in Scripture as Mystery Babylon. This false religious system began with Nimrod after the flood and will climax at the end of time, just before the Savior returns for his faithful obedient saints. We have now only to inquire, what was the name by which Nimrod was known as the god of the Chaldean mysteries? That name was Saturn. Saturn and mystery are both Chaldean words, and they are correlative terms. As mystery signifies the hidden system, so Saturn signifies the hidden god. To those who were initiated, 
the God was revealed. To all else, he was hidden. Now the name Saturn in Chaldee is pronounced Satur, but as every Chaldee scholar knows, consists only of four letters, thus stir. If the Pope is, as we have seen, the legitimate representative of Saturn, the number of the Pope as head of the mystery of iniquity is just 666. But still further, it turns out that the original name of Rome itself was Saturnia, the city of Saturn. Thus then, the Pope is the only legitimate representative of the original Saturn at this day in existence. And he reigns in the very city of the Seven Hills where the Roman Saturn formerly reigned and from his residence in which the whole of Italy was long after called by his name, being commonly named the Saturnian land. Satan, in his deceptive device of providing two counterfeit worship days, has hidden the truth. Those who worship on Saturday, once they have learned of the original lunar solar calendar of creation, will receive the mark of the beast in the same manner as those who worship on Sunday. Receiving the mark of the beast is simple. All that is required is to calculate one's worship day by a calendar other than the Creator's calendar. The lunar Sabbath contradicts the message for this time, which is the three angels' messages. On the contrary, the Lunar Sabbath truth is the complete fulfillment of the three angels' messages. The first angel's message declares, Fear Yahuwah, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. The first angel's message bears a striking resemblance to the fourth commandment. In both, worship is due Yahuwah because he is the creator who, in six days, made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. The keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the true God, him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It follows that the message which commands men to worship God and keep His commandments will especially call upon them to keep the fourth commandment. The only way honor can be given the Creator is when He is worshipped on the day which He has blessed and set apart as holy time. The first angel's message is a call to return to honoring the Creator by worshipping him on his Sabbath, calculated by his original calendar of creation. The second angel's message follows swiftly. Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Babylon, that huge infrastructure of tradition, paganism, and deceit, is precariously balanced on a single lie. The lie that the Savior was resurrected on Sunday. It is this belief that has led almost the entire Christian world into worship on Sunday. The assumption that Yahushua was resurrected on Sunday carries with it a companion deception. The belief that Saturday is the Sabbath because it comes on the seventh day of the week, right before Sunday, the first day of the solar week. When the truth is revealed, when people realize the Julian calendar of the Savior's day had an eight-day week, when the biblical record is understood to reveal a different calendar and a different seventh-day Sabbath, Babylon falls. The lie on which Babylon is based is destroyed with the truth of the lunisolar calendar of creation. The third angel's message proclaims, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Yahuwah, 
which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Once a person learns the truth and can clearly discern the lie upon which Babylon is built, he has the responsibility to set aside error and tradition. He has the duty to worship his Creator on the day set aside for that purpose. In marked contrast to the world stands the little company who will not swerve from their allegiance to God. These are they of whom Isaiah speaks as repairing the breach which had been made in the law of God. They who are building the old waste places, raising up the foundation of many generations. The most solemn warning and the most awful threatening ever addressed to mortals is that contained in the third angel's message. The sin that calls down the wrath of God, unmixed with mercy, must be of the most heinous character. Is the world to be left in darkness as to the nature of this sin? Most assuredly not. God does not deal thus with his creatures. His wrath is never visited upon sins of ignorance. Before his judgments are brought upon the earth, the light in regard to this sin must be presented to the world, that man may know why these judgments are to be inflicted and may have opportunity to escape them. The Lunar Sabbath Truth meets its complete fulfillment in the three angels' messages. The substance of the second angel's message is again given to the world by that other angel who lightens the earth with his glory. These messages all blend in one to come before the people in the closing days of this earth's history. All the world will be tested and all that have been in the darkness of error in regard to the Sabbath of the fourth commandment will understand the last message of mercy that is to be given to men. All God requires is that we worship on the seventh day of whatever calendar society is using. Such reasoning is extremely inconsistent. Seventh-day Adventists have always insisted the precise day does matter. If it does not, then one may as well worship on Sunday or Friday or any other day of the week that is most convenient. All who would avoid receiving the mark of the beast will show their allegiance to the Creator by worshiping on the day He set aside and blessed, the Seventh-day Sabbath. This can only be found by using the calendar designed and established by the Creator Himself. Of those who heed the heavenly warning, Scripture declares, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of Yahuwah and the faith of Yahushua. Since those who keep God's commandments are thus placed in contrast with those that worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, it follows that the keeping of God's law on the one hand and its violation on the other will make the distinction between the worshipers of God and the worshipers of the beast. Heaven's last message of mercy a loving warning has now come to you. The invitation is yours. Return to the worship of the Creator and honor Him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them.